Uh, there's a lot of um, beatitudes. Beatitudes is what Jesus told his disciples. Beatitude means have a this particular attitude and there is a beatitudes that Satan gives to his disciples and you'll be very curious to hear about that today. Blessed are those who are too tired, too busy, too distracted to spend an hour once a week with their fellow Christians in church for they are my best workers. Blessed are those who wait to be asked and expect to be thanked. I can use them in my business. Blessed are those who are touchy soon they will stop going to church. Verily, they shall be my missionaries. Blessed are those who sow gossip and trouble, for they are my beloved children. Blessed are those who have no time to pray, for they are my prey. Blessed are those who gossip, for they are my secret agents. Blessed are you, are you when you read this and think that it has to do with other people and nothing to do with you. I've got room for you in my inn as well. <laughs> pretty strong huh let me throw you something a little bit lighter I've never shared a uh, a joke about blondes but I'm just gonna share once okay <laughs> for those of you who that gets offensive just mute it for just a second there's a lot of other type you had to mute it but um, uh, a Russians and Americans and uh, and a blonde were talking and the Russian says you know that they were first into the what were the Russians first into in the space, Americans were saying, we're the first into the moon. Well, the blonde is saying, we are going to be first on the sun. <laughs> the Russians and the Americans say, that's not possible. And the blonde says, well, we're not stupid. We're going to go during the night. <laughs> My wife is not blonde. That's the only reason I'm able to share that. I want to speak today briefly about schemes. Schemes. Today that word is no longer strange because we have Craigslist schemes. How many of you ever fell for a, uh, a scam on Craigslist? Nobody? I remember uh, once that they were selling a Lexus, a Mercedes and BMW. Brand new for $10,000 in Idaho. The only thing you needed to do is just send $2,000 first. It felt so real and when I watched that I felt like this prophetic unction that these three cars were mine. Almost fell for it. I remember one uh, friend of mine, uh, a sibling of mine actually who got a job from, for this photographer. The only thing she needed to do is cash his checks and send him the money. And we all know that's a scam. I know another person who uh, got a place for very cheap, very beautiful house for such a good price and they were about to pay their deposit when they found out a scammer just took a picture of that place and that place wasn't even for rent. There's a lot of scams going on online. There's a lot of Ponzi schemes that are going on around and we all get a chance many times to get deceived or to get tricked. But all of these deceptions, all of these tricks, none of them are as painful and as damaging even though some of them could be very damaging to a person's finances, their relationships and their life. As a scheme, I will talk to you today about. This scheme is the oldest scheme. This scheme is the secret scheme. And this scheme is not by some kind of a hacker or some kind of a spammer in Nigeria or some Indian country or somewhere in America some guy in the basement of his mother's house trying to rip people off who are shopping online on Amazon. This scheme is by your worst enemy and this scheme we are going to not only learn about today in just a few moments but we're going to be able to disclose it, put it to shame and put it an end to it. In Jesus name. Can somebody say amen. If you have your Bible you can go ahead and follow me. If you don't you can look at the screen. Numbers chapter 25 verse 17 and verse 18. Harass the Midianites. I know a lot of you guys you know many things in the Bible are hard to do but the, this one is not very hard. It's like harass. God is telling Israel I want you to harass this particular enemy and attack them. For they harassed you 
with their schemes by which they seduced you in the matter of Peor. We'll stop on that part. Most of you are very familiar with this story as I'm going to bring it to you. What happens is when Israel was going to their promised land, there was this nation of Midianites. These were tribes scattered everywhere and lived on different territories. And they saw how big Israel was and they knew that they didn't stand the chance fighting them equally. Meaning fighting them army fighting an army. So what they did is the king went and hired this guy named Balaam. And Balaam was a sorcerer. And Balaam was the guy who would throw spells on countries, people, marriages and they would collapse. And Balaam did it for money. And then he would pronounce certain spells of blessings and it would work for them. So the king went in and sent a lot of money and sent a lot of people and says, Balaam, come over here. I have a job for you. I'm going to pay you a lot because it's going to be a big place. I want you to throw a spell on and curse this place. And so Balaam comes in there and he's about to, you know, throw the curse. But something happens. God stops him and God says, you can't throw the curse on these people. They're already blessed. And the reason why they're blessed is not because they're perfect but because they have a relationship with me and then I mentioned that on Sunday when Balaam was looking at the nation of Israel Balaam said this I see no iniquity in Israel and there is no transgression in their camp meaning they are perfect and the God is on their side and the shout of the king is among them it's very interesting because anything, if you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know, Israel was not perfect. Israel had iniquity and had transgression. Israel had a lot of sins. But why was Balaam not allowed to see Israel's sin? Because their sin, like we were singing during worship today, was covered. And therefore every spell and every witchcraft, it couldn't stick to Israel. Why? Because in the spiritual world, while Israel was sleeping, eating, living their life, trying to grow in their understanding of God, God put a blockage in the spiritual world. Every witch doctor, every warlock came against it and says, we can't do it. These are perfect people. I want to tell you something. When you have a relationship with God, when you have a real authentic relationship with God in the spiritual world you have an umbrella that protects you even when you don't know and the enemy comes against you he will bounce back off why because God places a protection and God sees you and makes the enemy sees you as a perfect that is perfect amen I remember reading this book about a lady who was uh, Satan's wife she got so deep into Satanism that she actually saw Satan uh, physically and started to do very, very crazy things. Her crazy story and one particular time she was mentioning when she was moving up into the ranks of witchcraft, one of the assignments they received from the higher demons was to attack this particular Christian family and to cause confusion there. And so what they did is they actually left their bodies, she describes that as her experience, she left her body and in the spiritual world she, they went into the house of these Christians and lo and behold they saw these gigantic humongous beings all around that little poor house and the flame was coming from all part of their body and they had swords on both sides and they were standing ready to raise hell if it needs to be and they said we gathered all of the witches that we knew and tried to battle against them the more we threw against them the weaker be we became until for our own lives we went back into our bodies and said we will never ever touch that house again but the next day that higher demon came and punished them for not succeeding you have to understand when you have a relationship with God you are covered you are covered see having relationship with God is not the same thing as believing God exists many people today they say I believe God exists I remember talking to a particular young lady uh, yesterday who was mentioning that she's trying to tell her friend you know who is facing demonic activities in her life says you need you need to come to God she says I believe in God believing in God is not enough the scripture says demons believe in God but it's not helping them at all they're headed into hell I believe in a football player called Messi I believe in him I don't know him and I don't have a relationship with him and frankly I don't care about him as awesome as Messi is 
I bought a book on his biography to give to prophet T.B. Joshua because T.B. Joshua likes mercy from what I heard from a few people. When he was playing in Seattle, you wouldn't move me with a semi truck to go watch mercy play. Why? Because I'm not interested. I believe he exists. I believe he's the champion. I watched few clips there and there and he's an awesome guy but me and Mercy we have nothing going on and that's exactly how many people have a relationship with God. They believe he exists. They believe he's the big guy upstairs but the relationship with him they don't have. That's why any spell, any curse sticks to you like a super glue. Why? Because you're unprotected. You can have a Geico for your car, but you need the blood for the spiritual world. Can somebody say amen? You can have all state for your house, but let me ask you today, are you in the good hands with your spirit? Because only the blood, somebody say blood. Say the blood. Only the blood is your umbrella against demons, witches, warlocks, and any spell or any curse people throw you away. That's why when people curse you, when people say, I hope you break, I hope you collapse. How many people fasted and cursed our church and said, we hope none of you will make it. You know what happens with that? If we are covered with the blood, a curse is like a ball. You throw it in, in the wall, it hits you right back in your face. But it's not going to destroy the wall. And a lot of those people who fasted, even against our church, sadly to say, and this is not something we rejoice about. The very things they fasted against us begin to visit our own families. That's why to us, most important thing is that I'm under umbrella. I'm in a relationship with God. There's many, many benefits of knowing God personally. But one of them is this. There's a devil and there's demons and they're out to get you all the time. You're sleeping, you're resting and they're using whatever it takes to get to you. But when you are under blood, they come close. You're not perfect, but you're covered. You're not perfect, but you're being perfected. You're not perfect but you're being protected. You're not perfect but when you're walking there is a spiritual umbrella that all the, st all the curses they don't stick. They stick out. Why? Because you're covered by the blood. Can somebody say amen? The first scheme of the devil is the direct attack. So write this down. The first scheme is the attack. It's a direct assault. It's when he uses the spiritual forces to come against us. And our protection as Christians is the blood of Jesus. When you don't have a relationship with God, you are vulnerable. You are vulnerable. Being Catholic does not mean you have a relationship with God. I like to always say it, going to Starbucks has never made me into a latte. Going to a church will not make you a Christian. You have to make your personal decision to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and go under the protection of his blood, under the protection of the covering of the church and in your family so God's grace rests upon your life. So when things come against you, when demons come against you and trust me they do, when a nightmare comes against you that they don't stick to you, they come and they leave like oil drips and gets through your fingers but it doesn't get stuck. Exactly happens with those curses and demonic assaults because you're covered. Can somebody say amen? But the second scheme of the devil is when Balaam could not curse Israel and it didn't work. Balaam, and I want you to write down, is attract. Seduction of sin. Balaam blessed Israel but he comes to the king Balak and he says, the whole cursing thing is not going to work. These people have a relationship with their God. These people, they're covered. The spiritual world, they don't even know what they have. But they have something so amazing. But there's a secret. It will take time and it will work. And he tells Balak, he says, I want you to strategically and I'm kind of paraphrasing this, adding some color to it because the Bible says that according to the counsel of Balaam, they did this thing where they strategically begin to put women and men on the border between Israel and this tribe so that people will um, hook up, connect, uh, experiment, different cultures, uh, different types and shapes colors and appetites that people will begin to mingle together 
and they started to mingle at first it was just a seduction it led to more of a sexual sins and it led to more being loosed until Israelites begin to come and worship their gods and idols and then a plague broke out with Israel and then we see a punishment came upon Israel Satan's second more sneaky scheme it's not only to come and attack you with a curse or attack you spiritually with this like you don't know what it came from it just attacked you his second scheme is when he presents something that looks like something you so want it looks like a cherry like a strawberry it looks that so delightful it's seductive and then you go for it and you see the bait but because the bait looks so good tastes so good you don't see the hook and as you go for the bait and you always know baits are short hooks are strong and you end up on the hook and you realize you're hooked on something you say no I'm gonna get out of this I'm gonna get out of this but the reason you can't get out of this is because it's not just the hook that's holding you it's that something is holding the hook outside of the world you're living in and wheeling you in into himself and that someone is the devil and that's why people will swear people make promises to their spouse that's the last time I took Jack Daniels that's the last time I'm gonna take that Marlboro you know that's the last time that Playboy magazine is gonna end up in my mailbox that's the last time I will take a razor and touch my veins that's the last time that I will lie to you listen mom last time I will steal money from your purse last time but see when you're a fish on a hook you are not in control of your last time you're only in control of your bait you can only control when it's going to be the first time you take the bite but you don't control when the last time you're going to leave the hook that's why we must understand demonic schemes is to present something that looks like good but behind it is the devil that promises something but it doesn't deliver every commercial every beer commercial never tells you about the second dui every beer commercial doesn't show you when a man beats a woman so hard she ends up in emergency and the man gets a statue with the law and he ends up in jail every commercial for a playboy magazine doesn't show you how children suffer and how a man becomes an addict and then becomes a pervert it will never show you that every gambling commercial will never show you how you will gamble your children's college fund it will never show that every time a commercial says life is short have an affair it will never show the pain the disgust the addiction because it only shows the bait and the hook is well hidden and many people when they end up on the hook they feel like it's already too late I want to speak to those today who are like Israel fell for the bait I want to speak to those who not only fell for the bait but you found yourself pregnant in debt ten fifteen thousand thousand dollars abortion I want to speak to those today who have experimented because you thought college life is going to be an experimentation but it turned not into experimentation it turned into a torment you made decisions that today you're thinking your life is over and you're only 25 when Israel fell for the bait and the plague started the plague was intending to completely completely wipe them out but three things happened I want you to write it down number one one man speared the cause of that plague instead of sparing it spirit don't spare it so sparing it means you stop the sin in its tracks Spearing it means though your situation is already deep though you are in already trouble that you feel like you're not gonna get out of it one of the best ways when you are in the, in the hole is you have to stop digging is you stop doing what you're doing with the devil for a lot of people like last Wednesday a young man gave his life to Jesus the way he speared his sin is when he went back home he took those cigarettes and he took that alcohol and he told himself this does not belong in my mouth 
The reason why is God didn't put a chimney on my head. The reason why how other people would do it is they will come and they will simply disconnect certain people from their life who constantly lure them back into sin and you bring a spear because many people they don't spear their sin they spare their sin. I wish your sin would treat you the same. I wish the drugs would treat us the same. I wish the immorality would treat us the same. I wish that the alcohol would treat us the same. I wish that all of these of disobedience and rebellion would treat us the same but you got to spear that thing. Can somebody say amen? It means you got to put an end to it. For some people it's just simply throw certain, delete certain numbers. For some people it's turn off certain things. For some people it's to change their jobs because where you're working today every single day you're tempted against your own will. Number two is God said after a man speared the cause of that God says take vengeance. What I really liked about God is that though Israel fell prey to their sin, though Israel fell into that on their own decision and betrayed God. It's almost like cheating against God. God did not throw them out. God came in and said, I want you to fight Midianites for me. But God, that's not their fault. They were just a bait. We took the bait. God says, I know. But the fact they seduce you. I'm angry against them and I want you to execute vengeance against that which seduced you. But it was my fault God. I was weak. I can't blame the devil for that. No you can't but you can fight him. You can resist him but you can trample on him. Why? God says for me. Why? Because I'll feel better. Why? Because he provoked you my child. He caused you pain. He distracted you from me and I will not let nothing to keep you away from me but you and me we will get that thing out of the way. See God is not against you. Even if what you did you turned your back on him and you fell for a lie and you got deceived. I want to tell you something. God will take vengeance not on you but with you and that very thing and you will execute it and you will put it to an end and you will have a victory in your life for his glory can somebody say amen can somebody say amen see I will take vengeance on my enemy on sin on Satan for God's glory and lastly is give offering when they executed their enemies when they put an end to all of their enemies they came back and they had a very interesting situation because this battle we don't see many battles mentioned like that in the bible where there was no casualty of war whatsoever meaning not one Israel soldier died they were so happy with it that they brought 400 pounds of gold as an offering to God saying God not only you took us back when we fell into sin but you helped us to fight it and you helped us to win it and God we just want to come to you and say God thank you. See when God helps you to get back on your feet this is one thing you got to do is you can't go back your give your perfect self to the devil again. You got to give your awesome restored forgiven self back to God and say God now I am all yours. The way I serve that devil is gonna the way I'm gonna serve you. Every Friday night I dance to the I lost my consciousness. Every Friday night here I'll pray until I gain my spirit. I spent 400 to 700 dollars on weed without even thinking God I'm gonna learn to tithe. I woke up very early in the morning to go find drugs. I'm gonna wake up in the morning to go find your presence. I read every witchcraft thing that came on the shelves, every sexually sensitive material. God, now I'm going to read every book that Joyce Meyer releases. Why? Because I will give myself as an offering to you. I'm not going to be for sale. I'm not going to belong to myself no more. I'm going to be your property. I'm going to belong to you, my body and everything about me. Because somebody say amen. I understand that what I would just preach to you or talk to you is nothing very new. Last Sunday we had a prayer line and during this prayer line we saw when God delivered people. I want you to take a look at just a short clip of where a young man was delivered. 
just to kind of refresh your memory a little bit of what I'm talking about is real. Satan is real. His plans are real. It's to kill, steal and destroy. I mentioned two main tactics where he does it directly and then he does it sneakily. He tries to attack us but through the power of Jesus we can overcome. This young man, he opened his life to the devil. He began to destroy his life but Jesus didn't come and kick the young man in a curve and says you're such a terrible loser. He came, he kicked the devil out and says devil you're such a terrible loser and saved that man and that man got baptized. Destroy his life, speak out. It's mine. He's yours. He belongs to Jesus. His body is the temple of the Spirit and you made the biggest mistake of letting him come to this place. Holy Ghost, fire right now all over your body. How you destroyed his life. Speak out. He hates you. He hates me. He how do you destroy his health? How, how would you do with his health? He hates. He hates what? Everything. He hates Speak. everything. Why, why have you done to his relationships? He doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve anything. You broke every relation that he had. Is that true? He doesn't have anything. Hatred. Selfishness. Jealousy. Jealousy. Rage. What else? Rage. Rage. What else? Emptiness. Emptiness. How would you destroy his finances? What would you do to his finances? He buys things. He buys things and what? Anything. Anything. We have fun. Speak out. Yeah. How would you destroy his life? Speak out. He has emptiness. He has emptiness. He has emptiness. How did you enter his life? Through what means did you enter his life? He gave up when I told him it would be fine. You, he, he, he gave up. I convinced him. You convinced him what? God isn't real. You convinced him that God isn't real. Well, you made the biggest mistake allowing him to come into this place. Just forward it where and right he gets, now, uh, we'll expose he every deliver in Jesus' mighty name. Stand up. Stand now, Austin, um, what happened to you? How did that evil spirit, when did you begin to start to see that that evil spirit start operating in your life? Um, when I was 17, I tried to take my own life. Um, I started to see this, this old man come into me in dreams. And he would stand across a river and just tell me, just cross the river, come over and be with me. I'll take care of you. I'll be your friend. And I saw him six or seven times over the years. So every, at 17, you were trying to take your life. This old man shows up in the dream who you mentioned to me that he was very comforting and like very drawing. And he would stand across the river. And the river many times in the dream speaks of death. And he was calling him across to come to that side. And it happened five or six times. And you mentioned that it would happen every time you would go through the hardest times of your life correct? Yeah, it was anytime I just felt hopeless, anytime I felt like there was just no turning back from where I was, I was at rock bottom, I would just have a dream that night and I'd wake up and I would just feel like killing the first person I saw. I was so hateful when I woke up and it would last for a week or two sometimes, you know, I would just... Who, would you, who did you think that man was? I didn't know until I uh, actually made a friend who, uh, she was into witchcraft and and you mentioned she was doing wood. Yeah, it was. Um, he's actually the keeper of the crossroads uh, between earth and hell. And she told me all about him and described him perfectly. And so she begins to describe to you this yeah. man that you see in a dream. Mm -hmm. and, and what was the name that she gave him? Uh, his name is Legba. Okay, so she begins to even has a name mm -hmm. and everything. She begins to say that he's the keeper between heaven and, uh, and, and death or earth and death mm -hmm. and everything. And what does she tell you to do? Uh, she told me how to make offerings to him, little candies and toys and chili peppers for some To reason. a guy in the dream? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, you know, if you set up an altar like this and just leave him little things, then when you come back in the morning, it'll be gone. And then you'll have some blessing in your life. Something great will happen. And things did happen. I had a job with more money than I knew what to do with. Um, you know, I had this nice apartment that I was living in. Everything was cool, you know, mm -hmm. I, so I thought. And then I'd go to sleep, just cry myself to sleep every night and didn't know why. And I would wake up and just wish that I hadn't. And I didn't know why. And I was miserable. And so, Austin, you grew up with a Christian background. So you knew about God. Yeah. Did it ever register into your mind, setting up candies for people you see in a dream, uh, getting advice from a voodoo lady, probably not a good idea. 
No? You know? Or because it just, you were at that point well, where you didn't care? His, his, his deal is he's the, uh, the trickster, they call him the deceiver. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, why not? He's a friend. You know, I give my friends rides to work. I give my friends food if they're hungry. I give my friends clothes if they need it. I'll give this old man a piece of candy. <laughs> <laughs> he's just an example of a scheme. It's not a Craigslist scheme, a voodoo scheme, where you just get played for. Now, on Sunday, you, you got saved about three weeks ago. You gave your life to Jesus three weeks ago. And then you knew that prayer line is going to be on Sunday. Yeah. Now, you've never seen the prayer line before. Mm -hmm. So you don't even know if we're going to pray with oil, hose, or <laughs> nothing. You actually thought we're going to come and do like this over you, and that's it. Yeah. Or, or like that, okay. That's close enough. Close enough, yeah. Tell me, a day before prayer line, what started happening to you? Uh, have you guys ever been in trouble? Like you're speeding and then all of a sudden you see the red and blues behind you. That feeling you get in your heart like, oh no, mom's going to find out. Like, so that, that feeling of just being afraid, but afraid for a stupid reason. Like, well, it's my fault. I had it coming, but man, I wish it wouldn't happen this way. I wish I wasn't in trouble right now. Mm -hmm. And it started to well up in me and I just started feeling like, man, maybe I shouldn't go tomorrow. Maybe it's... You know, I can, I can go to the gym instead. I'll just go to Portland and spend money I don't have. I'll, you know, do this, do that, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then around 1 o'clock at night, I thought, maybe I should just go to the bar. Maybe I should just, you know, call up an old girlfriend. Maybe I should this or that or whatever. And I ended up staying up all night and just fighting against this. Everything that went through my head was just saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. And then begging me not to go at around 4 in the morning. And uh, I said, I'm going to. I have to. And then about 5.30, I thought, why don't I just hang myself? I should just kill myself right here. There's a rope in my closet. I'm sure, I could just do it. And I just thought, God, this is it. This is, I have to do this or it's going to kill me. And so I got here this, um, that morning on Sunday, and I texted Vlad and said, man, I'm terrified. <laughs> and he texted me back. He said, don't be afraid. Jesus is with you. And the second, the second he said that, it was like a, the final gunshot. You know, he, he knew it was done. And I just gave up. I felt my body just go limp, just... <sighs> That's it. And, and then when was... deliverance was happening, that evil spirit, he left your body. And it wasn't him that was terrified. It was the devil was terrified. Because the devil has been here long enough and he's seen the prayer lines and stuff. So it's not his first rodeo. And so he typically knows what's going to happen there. And he was the one that was terrified and pushing him to not to come so he doesn't receive his deliverance. And after that, so you got delivered. How did you feel afterwards? I felt like I was about 20 feet tall and full of muscle, you know, so. <laughs> oh, the girls usually feel light. The guys feel tall and big. So different. I, I felt made new. Um, I uh -huh. tried to explain it to Vlad that if you could imagine every star in the universe and then bring those all together inside this one little 200-pound piece right here, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, you just take all these little bright points, and there's no darkness in between them anymore, and then put them all together and build it like that. Build it piece by piece and cell by cell and part by part, and then actually give it a heart and give it a purpose. And that was what I found in Christ. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, you texted that lady. <laughs> oh, Tell us yeah. what happened. <laughs> So, so the lady who introduced you to those little uh, giving yeah. candies to the old people in Dreamer, huh? Now, keep in mind, black lipstick, black eyeliner, black everything, you know, wears crowns outside. Um, so she tells me, well, the older gods were here first and they don't let you leave. If you try to leave, your life is over. They, they're very, they have a spirit of vengeance in each one of them. And I said, well, I really don't care because my God's bigger. And the second I told her that, she just said, well, looks like that's the end for you then. You're never going to be happy again. I said, yeah, I know. I'm going to be ecstatic for the rest of my life because I have God. And then, and then she blocked you. Yep. Done. Just straight out of my life like that. And then she blocked you. No problem. <laughs> Bye. Devil is bad. Jesus is good. Jesus is greater. And devil is defeated. Everything he presents is a lie. Everything he shows is a trick. And don't fall for it. You will either pay now or you're going to pay later. But you're going to pay for it. 
but when you choose the way of Christ it might be hard it might be narrow but it always leads to life not depression not discouragement but it leads to life can somebody say amen